Hey y'all, Mark here from Fids and Fibers, uh, Renaissance Acres Tree Care and the Growth Ring. And I want to do a quick video today. Maybe it won't be so quick, but I want to do a video today. Uh, a conversation was sparked online by a guy named Ben Drew uh, regarding bridges. And he was a little frustrated that uh, I didn't answer his question on a thread that had to do with um, testing out new technology on social media. And his question was about rope bridges. And so I wanted to, I put down some thoughts about rope bridges and I wanted to chat about it. And uh, hopefully that'll answer Ben's question. And hopefully you won't be so frustrated with me. <laughs> Hi Ben. All right, so some thoughts on rope bridges. Number one, use manufacturer recommendations. So whatever saddle you have, um, if it comes with a rope bridge, use the rope bridge that the manufacturer recommends. There's a bunch of reasons for that. Uh, the engineers that work on the harness and work with the rope have familiarity with the rope product that they're choosing, which means the construction, the fiber content, the number of fibers per strand, the coatings they use, uh, how much tension they put on the braider, uh, just the durability and flexibility uh, of that rope. And they don't just pull it out of their butts, they actually have a lot of experience and know which ropes are gonna work well in that application. So their familiarity with the product, uh, they're not gonna choose something that's not gonna work. So we need to rely on them. The next thing is testing, testing, testing. They test the crap out of it. And they'll do it in the lab, they'll do it on the brake test machines, they'll do it theoretically, and then they'll put it out in the field and have and test it before it reaches the market. So as you all know, there are people out there who test products, they get them all the time. We all look up to some of those folks and that's what gets them some free product to test. And we, uh, rely on those people's expertise to give positive feedback or negative feedback to the manufacturers and make changes. And that iteration is, all happens before we even see the product. So that testing, whether it's uh, theoretical, whether it's in the lab, whether it's in real life, whether it's on a brake test machine, is really important. Uh, a note on testing is testing is not initially done on live subjects. Um, and the reason I want to say that out loud is, is that if you get it in your mind that you want to test a different bridge material on your saddle than the manufacturer recommends, you are now testing on a live subject without the engineer's uh, calculations or familiarity with the product or even some of uh, our peers out in the world testing it uh, with their recommendations, you're actually just going out on your own into the wilderness and that's when bad things can happen. Uh, we had that situation um, about 15, 18 years ago, people started using uh, class two fibers, you know, Dyneema Vectran Technora for rope bridges. When that stuff came out, the brake test numbers on that stuff were massive and they, they were small diameter ropes. So people were like, oh, I'll just use, uh, you know, Vectran or Technora as a bridge. And we found out that not only do the knots slip, but the fiber is self abrading. And so with a little bit of rubbing from a carabiner loaded in a tensioned and untensioned and compression, you know, situation, it would actually wear through and the worst part was is that if you had uh, a class two fiber inside a polyester fiber, you couldn't inspect it. And when they were finally taken apart and inspected, the core of the rope had actually separated down and wasn't even touching inside. The climber was being held aloft by just the polyester cover and the knots that were holding that together. Uh, so yeah, things can go wrong. Um, there is little margin for error when you're using a live subject for testing. So that's why I like to rely on the manufacturer specifications. 
uh, and some of the other information I'll, I'll talk about. But the other thing from the manufacturer is they're coming out with a lowest common denominator because they're going to sell saddles to people of all various skills and all various expertise out in the marketplace. And so they want to have no questions arise about their bridge. And so it's an ease of support issue. When people call and say, what my bridge is worn out, what should I use? Or is my bridge worn out? Here's a picture of it. Most often they're going to say, yes, replace it. Because why take a risk for a 15, 20, 30, $40 part and your life? The scales don't match up. So uh, lowest common denominator, ease of support. Change your bridge, change it often. Inspect your bridge before, during, and after every climb and change it anytime there's a question. Uh, liability. So the manufacturer doesn't want to put a saddle out that has a bad bridge on it. So they'll have, they'll have tested it, they'll have durability tested it, they'll make sure it meets ANSI, and if something happens to it, they're covered with their insurance company for liability. If you change it to something other than what came on the saddle, then you're gonna be out of compliance for the saddle, and their insurance won't cover your butt, it's gonna be on your insurance. Uh, it also gives the manufacturer control over recalls and updates. So let's say they put a bridge out, and this has happened. A company put a bridge out. That bridge was after many climbs and, and being out in the field. That bridge was known to start to fail. And when that happened, they recalled all those bridges and replaced them. And that gives the manufacturer control to do that. So... Uh, Let's see, feedback. So if a manufacturer puts out the same bridge on all their saddles, then all the feedback they get about how it wears uh, is valuable, and then they can make choices to change it in future versions. But if everyone has different stuff, then that feedback is kind of useless for them, so they can't really make it the product any better over time. Uh, I use the word iteration. Uh, the number of of climbers climbing, the number of days they climb, uh, the number of times that saddle gets used, that bridge gets used and used in the wet, used in the dry, used in the wet, then the dry, you know, use of the heavy climber, use of the light climber, use of different styles. So all those iterations reveal the flaws in the material choice. And so that's how we move forward in the industry. Uh, I want to caution you against thinking that you are going to come up with the best bridge just through oh i like that color or it tied a nice knot it might have none of the other characteristics that you're looking for and that's not going to further the industry um, also the hardware interface on the saddle so there are some saddles that have steel hardware connections where the bridge is tied on and there are other ones that the the bridges are sewn maybe they're a strap or webbing material and they might have aluminum or steel hardware connections. They might have an anodized or a bare hardware connection. And through years of iterations of being climbed on and being you know, left out in the rain or working in the rain, you know, uh, we gain some insight as to what parts wear out. I, I know I've seen uh, Chris Coates had some tree motion saddles where he sweated so much that the anodizing just began to come off and the aluminum was was oxidizing and uh, that feedback allowed uh, tree motion manufacturer Teufelberger to make some adjustments to that all right uh, also brand different differentiation quality safety loyalty consistency so these are the things that you associate with I climb on a tree motion because it's safe here, it's comfortable here, the bridge does this, I can get the replacement bridges at this location. They offer different length bridges. Um, you know, Petzl is excellent at offering different length bridges for the Sequoia. Um, and so you gain a familiarity of what's available, how it works, what the quality of it is. And that way, if you buy one that has, that's 
poorly sewn or something like that, before you even put it on, you can know that it's wrong because you've inspected your old bridge so often and you gain this uh, sense of understanding that, that'll alert you to something before something goes wrong. And all of that comes with that branding, that, that brand loyalty, the feeling of quality that you get because that's what we, that's what we survive on is that feeling of quality. Like um, when you say the word Buckingham or you say the word Petzl or you say the word tree motion or monkey beaver, like the first thing that comes to your mind is a feeling of how you feel about that brand based on what you've been exposed to. Now the companies are, are working on to control that for you. They, they wanna make sure that their saddle brings that happy feeling, much like Coca-Cola did back in the day. They had the little jingle and you have a Coke and a smile and, and that brand loyalty helped them sell more product. Same thing with, the, with here, but this is life support. Um, so being life support, the saddle itself uh, is pulled, it's engineered, it's labeled. The rope bridge itself kind of falls into a gray area because the rope bridge itself is not labeled. So if you pick up a carabiner, you can, tra you can track it all the way back to the factory, what batch it was, what date it was, and if there was a recall and, and your carabiner falls in a range, you know what to do. When it comes with rope, you don't know that, whether it's your climbing rope or your rope bridge. Um, it's a bit of a gray area, and I think we're, we're gonna advance in the future to being able to track that stuff. I'm working with a company uh, who is doing some RFID stuff, but currently that stuff is not labeled and we don't know where it came from or when it was built. Uh, so there's a little bit of a crack there that things fall into. And that's why I think that rope bridges should be changed with manufacturer uh, specs, uh, manufacturer uh, part numbers. That way, when you buy it, there's a record of your credit card purchase and that comes in, that goes on your saddle. And if something happens, we can prove the chain of custody uh, of that piece so that there's liability coverage all the way around. Uh, next thing. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, I, I guess that's it. So that's my thoughts on rope bridges from the manufacturers. Um, now I know in practice there are a lot of people out there tying their own rope bridges and I'm not going to say you don't do it. I'm not going to be the guy that says you can't do it. Um, I don't think it's a wise choice, um, but I'm going to present some information that will help you make a better choice. So the first thing I mentioned earlier was uh, the difference between class 1 and class 2 fibers. So your class 2 fibers... Uh, your HMPE, Vectran, Technora, you know, Dyneema type products. Those are very, very strong, but they can be self-abrasive, uh, especially when wet. So we have informally outlawed bridge material made out of those things. Even though they're very, very strong, they don't last very long. And if they're hidden inside a polyester sheath, you can't inspect it. So that's gonna lead us more towards our uh, classic class one polyester products. And so what I've done is uh, put up some, some, this is how I think of rope. And first I wanna talk about the unique uh, characteristics of a rope bridge versus regular rope. So when you use rope, you use it in tension. You're always pulling on rope. Um, when we get in trouble is when we put it around a pulley or through a ring, and we all know that it adds friction, uh, it can add heat, and those are places, tension points, you know, um, uh, friction points where we can actually break a rope if we use too tight a bend radius. So we try to ease the bend radius, but a rope itself likes to be worked in tension. And I have a, a piece of hollow braid here to, to kind of describe that. So when you push a piece of hollow braid together, you can see all the fibers bunch up. But then as it comes into tension, they all settle and find their, they find their home and they lock in together. And as they do that, the, the, the let's see, what is this? this is probably a 12 strand. 
So the 12 strands all the way around the rope in 360 degrees all begin to take up their share of the load and shoulder their, their weight, shoulder their tension. And when we get in trouble is when we run it over, a, let's say through a ring, and we have rope in tension on the top because it's over a longer bend radius, and it's in compression on the inside because it's over a shorter bend radius. So now we have an unbalanced rope. We have compression and tension. And as arborists, we know about compression and tension from cutting trees. So when you're felling a tree, if it has heavy lean, it's the back of it's in tension, the bottom's in compression. And if you don't perform the proper cut to relieve that tension, you could end up with a barber chair. So you, you see the force centered somewhere up the tree and it breaks. Well, it's the same thing in rope. As you're running through a ring and you have compression and tension, now if there's 100% if there's of the load going through here, that 100% of the load is concentrated on the tension part, not on the compression part. And that means that this percentage of rope, let's say it's 50%, that 50% has 100% of the load, and this 50% has less or, or no load. And that's why ropes break, because they get unbalanced. So the best way to do, the best way to work with rope is a straight line. You put your weight on one side, you put the pulling force on the other and pull it. All the, the strands take equal weight and the, the, the weight moves where you want it to go. We very rarely do that. And we also very rarely do that because we have to have a termination on the end. The terminations always cause, cause concentration of uh, tension and compression. And that's where they're not balanced. So wherever you attach this to your prime mover, to your, your pulling device, is going to either have a knot or a splice there. And on this side, it's going to have either a knot or a splice there. And at those places is where the rope is likely to break because we all know that knots reduce the strength of rope by 50%. The reason is, is that now we've concentrated compression and tension in one area versus the rest of the rope, right? And so that's, that's why knots are, are weaker and that's why splices are stronger than knots because the bulk of the splice is designed to put the whole thing into a linear motion and let all the fibers take up the weight equally. So let's talk about the rope bridge. That's where, that's where we're headed on this. So the rope bridge is really unique. Uh, instead of being pulled in a, in a straight line and having tension applied equally, the rope bridge has a lot of problems. First of all, let's get this out of the way. There's a knot on one side of your bridge and a knot on the other side of your bridge, or a splice. If you have a, a webbing bridge, you have a sewn termination. Either way, when you put a loop on the end of this, whatever loop you end up with, there's going to be part of that that's going to be in compression and part of it's going to be stretched over a longer radius in tension. And that's going to be the place where we're concentrating tension and compression. So first off, we've got that problem. We're concentrating those forces there at both of those points. And so when we tie knots in a bridge, we always say that we want to make sure that we leave a three inch or more tail just in case the tension and compression over the, load, the cyclical loading on, off, on, off, on, off doesn't loosen up your knot and start to suck your tail out, okay? And it's the compression, it's the difference between the compression and tension that causes knots to work loose. So that's one thing that we need to think about. And not all ropes tie knots as well. You know that from your own experience. Like some knots have a really nice hand, a really nice soft softness and firmness, and they take a knot really well. And some ropes, you tie a knot, and it doesn't ever really set properly. And so you wouldn't want to choose a rope that didn't set properly to tie your knot. Next off, 
you have this area of the bridge that's in tension, just like this above here. So one side is pulling against the other side and all the fibers are lined up and it's working great. But right in the top where your carabiner or your swivel is attached, you've got another concentration of compression and tension. And that's where you notice all the wear in your bridge because that swivel's running on that and your fibers are unloaded and loaded as you move on it and it rubs the fibers against each other and that causes them to get fuzzy or fur out and then they start, they start to break. That's what the fuzziness is, is the microfibers in the, in the rope are starting to break and fray and it's starting to lose strength. Now, when we were talking about class two fibers like your Technora Vectrans, Dyneema's, uh, those fibers break because they're quite brittle and they're self abrasive. So as the pieces break off, those pieces act like glass or sand against each other and they cause further weakening and further breaking and further damage. Whereas polyester, uh, we don't really consider that a self abrasive uh, material. Let's see. I guess what I was saying is that the rope bridge itself is a unique way of using rope. We don't often point load rope like that. I mean, you could imagine that there would be a pulley there, but instead of the rope running through, we're running a Brit, we're running our, our uh, swivel or our carabiner back and forth across this, wearing against the side of it, wearing, or the bottom side of it, wearing, wearing, wearing. And there's not many other applications uh, in the rope world that we do that, which is <laughs> really ironic because this is a life support point. Like our lives are concentrated on this very weird and very unique way of using rope. And so to me, this is incredibly special. This is a place where I spend a lot of time, a lot of consideration. I think about it a lot. I inspect it before, during, and after use. I think about the climber's style. So if I'm looking at someone else's gear at a, at a comp or a gear inspection, I'm trying to probe the climber to find out what kind of climber are they. Are they, are they the kind of person that pounds and hammers their gear? Are they kind of the kind of person that wants to get every dollar out of that gear? How long has it been since they changed it? You know, what are they likely to do to it the minute that I approve it? If I put a check mark in the box on rope bridge, what are they going to go out and do tomorrow? And that's going to give me information as to whether or not I approve that bridge for use or I recommend that it gets changed tomorrow or do I trust the person to change it in the next week or do I just cut it and force them to change it right then? So uh, those are some considerations. This area right here is incredibly special, as are these. And these are the places where things are not balanced. Your knot is not balanced, it's not pulling this way, and your, your termination point or your, um, your swivel point on the rope is not balanced, it's in compression and tension. And so this triangle right here is a, a triangle that pay really close attention to. All right, let's talk about some different ropes. So the first one is hollow braid. That's the easy one. And that's what we talked about here. So this is a hollow braid. It's basically hollow in the middle. You can actually take your fingers, stick your finger right inside and pop it out, right? And so when you pull this down, it acts like a Chinese finger trap and it locks my finger in. Well, my finger's not fat enough for that one. So I'll put it inside this guy here and pull on that. And the Chinese finger trap action will be enough to kind of grasp my finger. And then when I push back to open it up, I can easily slide my finger out. Now this is great stuff. It's easy to splice. Um, one of the problems is, is if you used it in a rope bridge configuration, it would flatten out. Now the flattening out causes a couple problems. Uh, it concentrates force at the corners.
And what's happening here is the compression and tension forces are unbalanced there. So not only are they unbalanced at the knots and they're unbalanced in this, in this area, but they're also flattened out. Let me see if I can take the big guy. They're flattened out this way and they're unbalanced in the corners as your hardware runs inside that, right? So that can be a problem with hollow braid. Can you use it? This is rated at approximately 14 to 18,000 pounds. Can you use it? Yeah, you can use it. Uh, you, the good part about it is it's inspectable. The bad part about it is it's very rough. It's not very granular. The big fat fibers are gonna cause your carabiner or your um, swivel to bounce over the fatness of the fibers and it won't feel smooth. It'll feel more rough. And with that roughness comes wear, so you'll start to grind away at your aluminum of either your carabiner or your swivel. Um, and talk to, uh, talk to anybody who runs a swivel on a bridge. Uh, BJ Brock and I have talked about the 10% wear uh, on, on aluminum swivels in the past. And uh, some of those really give me pause. But this will accelerate that wear. So the, the roughness of these fibers are something to be considered. Now, if you take something smaller like this, this is rated at 6,000 pounds. Uh, this could be considered a bridge. It has a smaller amount, uh, a smaller fibers to it, so it will run a little smoother. But uh, in this configuration, if you splice it onto your bridge, you'd end up with your cores crossing over. And this is where your core this is the center of the product and your cores would go past center. And um, in, order, in an effort to kind of keep it round and full, you'd want to fill that whole core. And what'll happen is if you run a carabiner on this enough times, it'll start spitting the core fibers out. So the splice won't stay together the way that you want it to. So I would say that 12 strand hollow braids, while strong enough, they are very poor because they flatten, they cause a lot of friction, there's transitions for the knots. So if you did tie a knot in this thing around a piece of hardware, you can see that the transitions for this tension, compression, are great. And we really don't like that very much. And then your splice transitions are the same. So where your tapers come through, your tapers, your tapers will start poking out of the core and it won't last very long. So that's hollow braid. Now the next uh, thing I think about in rope construction are parallel cores. Now a lot of people will say 16 strand and kern mantle are two different things. Well, 16 strand and kern mantle are two ends of the same spectrum or two ends of the spectrum of parallel cores. And how I like to think about it is this. If you, if you take a look at a traditional 16 strand climbing line, like let's say the Arbor Master line, which is what I kind of came up on. Now, when you cut a piece of Arbor Master, and this is a little exaggerated, but I'm, I wanted to exaggerate it so that we could have some pictures that, that, made, it, that made you understand it. So, so if you take something like an Arbor Master that has a very heavy cover, and we're gonna say it's 70% cover, 30% core. So 70%, 30%. And we call these cover-dependent 16-strand ropes. And that's what I started climbing on back in the day, and that's the bridge that was on the saddle on that social media post that I, that I posted. A lot of people use 16-strand because it's cover-dependent. When something's cover dependent, that means you could actually take the core out of it and it would retain 100% of the strength of its rating. And they, uh, Samson used to write that the core didn't provide any additional strength of the rope. It was very counterintuitive and we've talked about it a lot over the years, but basically this cover has so much bulk that it is the strength of the rope. Uh, 
when you move into more of what I call a hybrid 16 strand, which Atlantic Braid, which is um, uh, All Gear, All Gear buys all their rope from Atlantic Braid, um, Plimcraft, Buccaneer, um, even New England ropes uh, are, I, I find New England ropes falls kind of in between here and here. But let's say that we came across a, a 16 strand climbing line that was 50% cover and 50% core. Now what happens with these ropes is that they, they don't actually say that they're cover dependent 16 strand anymore. They call them 16 strand climbing lines. And they don't act the same when you splice them because the cover is actually less percentage than these traditional guys. And so when you splice them, they don't act the same. And you're getting more and more strength from your core than you're getting more strength from your core than you got in the old, in the traditional one. And so now we're headed towards more of a Kern mantle rope. Now the Kern mantle ropes are 80% core and 20% cover. And I always kind of say like the adrenalines and the ecstatics um, and some of the newer lines like Mercury are kind of like a lingerie cover keeping together the, the strong core. And so it looks more like this. And that's why a 16 strand splice, so a traditional 16 strand splice has no core in the eye. Whereas you can't do that with a Kern mantle rope and you can almost not do that with some of these hybrid ropes. And so how these get spliced is you end up with some of the core strands in the eye taking up the strength so the eye doesn't become so weak that it won't work. But all these I consider parallel cores. Um, I can't really say if they're good for bridges or not. I would suspect that this is not a great bridge rope. I have a feeling the cover wouldn't stand up to a lot of abuse. I would say that this one has a lot of flexibility and it might be a really good bridge rope. And I would say that this one is extremely durable and fully uh, inspectable from the outside and that would make it a, bri a good bridge rope for that reason. Knotability might suffer whereas knotability is better. Um, durability is higher, where durability is less, where durability, I would say, would be much less here, as well as knotability. So do these make great bridge ropes? I don't know, I'd have to survey the manufacturers and see what they're putting on them. I'm not gonna make a, I'm not gonna say you should use this as a bridge rope, or you should use that, or you, you shouldn't. This has to do with common sense. It has to do with understanding the construction. It has to do with understanding the coatings. It has to do with understanding the, the fiber composition. And then the last uh, area down here is what I consider the double braids. And now the double braids, since I started climbing, have changed a lot. Um, in the beginning, I was climbing, uh, the climbing lines that I was on originally were, were more like this, where I consider this a rigging line now, like a stable braid or a New England stay set or a Husky, where you have like 50% core, 50% cover, or 60% core, 40% cover. But there, there's a match between the cover and the core so that the cover and the core each share the weight of the rigging. And the cover is durable enough that it can handle the abuse of natural crotching as well as pulleys, as well as being dragged through the mud and all that. And so that's what I consider when I look at a rigging line, I, I, I kind of see a bunch of strength in the cover and a bunch of strength in the core and they kind of match up. Whether it's 50-50 or 60-40 or 40-60, uh, they're, they're in that range. But then when I look at the high performance climbing lines, like let's say your Yale 11-7s, your blue moon and all that stuff. They have a thinner cover and a thicker core and they're really tightly woven and tightly braided and this makes a fabulous climbing line. Now, does it translate well to bridge material? Some do, some don't. 
And then in the double braids, there's also things called triple braids. So this would be your tachyons, your scions, your tendrils, where you have your cover, you have your core, and in the case of a softer rope, where there's a softer, like more of a lingerie feel core here, they'll actually put three or more strands of parallel core in the center to keep it round. So here's a piece of tachyon that I took apart. So there's your cover, there's your core. So I would say that this is, um, the cover is less bulk than the core, maybe by uh, 30 to 60, 30, 35 to 65 percent. And then these guys just run down the center of the core to keep that core round under load, especially when you're running through mechanicals, like the rope runner has the flat anvil, flattens the ropes out. Same with all the mechanicals. But they, they wanted to add a little bit more bulk in the core to keep that round when it's being flattened with a mechanical. That being said, this is another piece of tachyon. This is just the cover. That being said, the cover acts just like 12-strand hollow braid. So this is 12, this is 24-strand, uh, but it acts the same way. The Chinese finger trap action is what traps the core inside and then it traps the triple core inside that. So as everything pulls tight, it all pulls together and gives you the strength of the rope. Now this is where bridges are again are unique. If we're trying to get the strength out of the rope and we're pulling that like this to tighten it up on the, the cover, on the core, and on the triple, on the inner core and get everything working together. And then we put a carabiner on and put the load here, we're doing compression and tension. Now, something like Globe 3000 that uh, the Tree Motion uses, that rope, I don't think it was specifically engineered for rope bridges, but I think it was discovered that that rope that they had engineered for some other purpose worked really well as a rope bridge. And then they tested it and they chose it, and that's why they use it on their saddles. And that's the manufacturer recommendation for the tree motion saddle. And I, I don't want to change it. I'm happy with their choice. I'm happy with the fact that they stand behind it. They have testing behind it. Their engineers figured out the construction, the fiber, the coatings. They figured out how to terminate it. Remember earlier I mentioned that these are concentrated tension and compression and the difference be between tension and compression causes knots to work loose well it's no surprise to me that teufelberger used a knot with a long enough tail and then sewed it so that we could inspect it and make sure that if it was moving we could notice it and stop it and that's how life support should be i can only applaud them for the red thread that shows you when your bridge is moving um, I'm sure that there's a lot of things I've missed, a lot of things I've skipped, a lot of things I don't know. Um, and I'm sure that there's a lot of people out in the internet world that want to comment, feel free. I'm curious to see what things that, uh, what things I missed. I'll add it to my presentation. So the next time I give this one, I'll be a little smarter, but, um, yeah, inspect your bridge before you climb during your climb, after your climb, replace it often. And uh, climb high and fair leads. See you later.